Good evening. Welcome to episode five of Salon Sundays with Carrie. Uh, this evening, I'm playing for you uh, Fantasy Nine in E minor by Telemann. This is a, a kind of an interesting fantasy for me um, for several reasons. It's, it's in three movements. Um, the first movement is the Siciliana, and the Sicilian rhythm is um, uh, rom, ba bum, bum. Ba -bum -bum. This uh, usually in in three eight or some some version of that, um, and uh, rarely used. The second movement is really what um, the majority of our discussion today will be about. It is again not a dance form that I can identify. It's really much more like. Um, a Vivaldi sonata. It's in two four. It's um, it's it's very classical in nature, um, and it's a long binary form. The A part is repeated and the B part repeated. The A and the B are quite equal, and then the final movement is a gigue, and it's a it's a strange, funny gigue um, that's in nine eight. Now most gigues are in in three eight or six eight or twelve eight. Uh, but I guess nine eight is just fine. Was just fine for Telemann, um, and so the jig is. Since we'll be exploring the Bach jigs along with this fantasy, that's the reason why I chose this. But what I'd really like to talk about today has a little more to do with that second movement that that uh, I can't identify the form of um, or the dance form of. And just to review a little bit, last week in uh, talking about the dance pairs, we talked about all of the different forms that the, that the Baroque dance suite took and the titles. They could be fantasies, they could be suites, sonatas, partitas. And uh, we talked about the difference between a sonata, a church sonata, and a chamber sonata, uh, and how Bach's sonatas for solo violin that included fugues as well as uh, dance movements were church sonatas and his partitas, which included dance movements and these extra doubles for each of the dance movements, the partitas, these were chamber sonatas. It's a little bit strange to think about um, all of those words being thrown around, sonata, 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 when sonata could be a description of all sorts of levels of uh, thought in, in examining the literature. And I think it's, it's important to, to talk about two of the forms of contrast which developed um, throughout the Baroque period and then into the classical period because they give us a window into what became the predominant form in the classical period, which was the sonata form or sonata allegro form. So um, at any rate, we have contrast of high and low, fast and slow, sad, happy, uh, major, minor, uh, loud, soft, all sorts of contrast. However, the two very important parts of that to this discussion are harmonic contrast and structural contrast, form. In terms of harmonic contrast, if some of you don't know, almost all music is based on the principle that, well, two principles really. One, that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, and there's no place like home. So almost every piece of music begins in the tonic, in, uh, in the, the home key. And then it travels to the dominant, usually, which is uh, you know, the, uh, the, the arrival point, You're visiting a friend's house, the green grass on the other side of the fence. And finally, there is a return to the tonic. Now this is a very important aspect 
of the sonata form, which became uh, ubiquitous and the predominant form in the classical period. A sonata allegro form begins with an exposition, uh, the main theme, perhaps a second theme and a closing theme, and then there's a repeat sign. And at the end of that, at the, at the close of that repeat, we've cadenced in the dominant. We've gone to the other side of the fence. Then, after the repeat, the development section begins. It starts in the dominant. It can go meandering across the meadow and through many keys. And finally, it finds its way back home to the tonic. This is called the recapitulation. Now, the initial material, the first theme, the opening theme of the exposition, is the same as the opening theme of the recapitulation. So we're not only returning in terms of harmonic structure, we're returning in terms of motivic structure. We're returning in terms of the, the main music. The recapitulation usually stays in the home key instead of traveling to the dominant. So it's slightly different than the exposition. Um, and then perhaps we have a little coda and, and then the, the movement is over. Now, in the classical period, uh, we had symphonies and sonatas and, um, and concertos and string quartets, and all of them used sonata form to a, one degree or another in at least one of the movements, if not several of the movements. Um, I find it just absolutely fascinating as I've been looking at these fantasies and the suites and, and looking even at the Bach sonatas and partitas uh, with my eyes, not with my fingers. Um, I found it very interesting to consider that this Baroque dance suite began with a collection of dances, Alamont, Courant, Sarabangi, and this collection of dances, while each dance had its own characteristic, characteristics and some variety to it, the dance suite itself really was always built around the same four dances, the same structure. And this went on for about 100 years. And sometime about 1700, composers started to really get into exploring the different ways that they could present this dance suite. And so we find Telemann adding fugues and um, really altering not only specific dance forms, but making the whole structure kind of free and individualistic. And Bach presenting his very disciplined six suites for cello, each with an, an added prelude at the beginning and a set of dance pairs right before in the penultimate movement slot. His sonatas included fugues and then more traditional dance movements. His partitas had these wonderful dance movements with a double. We used the term last week, galanterie, or um, these fashionable, additional dances that were added. They're fashionable, fashionable, but unconventional. And I think that there's a sense of that in uh, everything that I'm playing for you on this series. However, what's interesting to me is that throughout the development of these forms and of these dance suites and of all of the compositions that you, you've heard, in almost every movement, there's some kind of return. Now the return may be placed in a strange place it may be, we have a, a, a binary form and the, uh, the, the A section ends in the dominant and then the B section goes all over the place and doesn't return to the tonic until the very end of the movement. That's actually the case of the, the Vivace that you'll hear the second movement of the fantasy number no. nine today. But it's also true that composers uh, would return to the tonic 
almost immediately, or in some strange way. Occasionally, they would return with the main theme. More often than not, Telamon does not return with the main theme. He just returns to the key in a individualistic way. So this, this idea of the return and that moment in music uh, got me thinking about how the sonata form developed out of the Baroque. And frankly, in study of, of other works by Bach, not so much the suites, but his sonatas for viola da gamba and harpsichord obligato, um, his orchestral suites and works, his concerti, and really most especially uh, the, my exposure to Vivaldi's works, all of his concerti and his sonatas, he wrote a set of six wonderful sonatas for cello, um, they exhibit very often a very straightforward sonata form. Exposition, repeat, development, and recapitulation. So the sonata form really was a Baroque invention. However, in the classical period, these early classical composers, and Scarlatti and Mozart and Haydn, as they were developing their string quartet, as they were developing the symphony, they used this sonata form, and they used it with great discipline. It was unheard of to break the rules. It was always exposition, development, recapitulation, and that was the first movement of a symphony. As you might imagine, they got a little uninterested in that. Perhaps the way Telemann and Bach got, wanted to bring more to the Baroque dance suite than just Alamon Courant, Sarabande, and G. And so what ends up happening in the classical period is that this sonata form, those composers began to toy with it. They began to do things to, to make a false recapitulation, or they make the recapitulation and then continue to develop material. Uh, they add quotas. Their development sections become, uh, in many cases, wild, almost like uh, unrelated music, though they're always related, but, but shocking, in fact. And the, the placement of the recapitulation became, became uh, the, the, the manner in which composers approached the recapitulation uh, became a matter for invention for individualizing, for breaking the rules. So in both cases, in the early Baroque, they spent a lot of time establishing the rules, and then they spent a bunch of time breaking them. And then in the early classical period, they spent a lot of time making the rules, and then they began breaking them. So that's uh, my uh, musicology <laughs> lesson for today. Again, disclaimer, I'm not a musicologist and I don't play one on TV. However, I think it's interesting for this fantasy that you're about to hear. Again, the first movement is a short Siciliano. And the second movement is Vivace. It's in 2-4 and it's a binary form. A, and I'm going to take both repeats today. But what I want you to listen for in the second section is right at the very end of it, the opening of the movement pops out. He returns for just the last phrase. He makes a recapitulation as the last phrase of the B section. And that's really uh, kind of a shocking place to put it, especially since in so many other cases, Telemann does not even return to the opening material. He returns to the key, but not the material. So that's interesting. And then the gig is a lot of fun, and we'll talk a little more about gigs after fantasy number nine.
So in the Baroque period, uh, cellists didn't use end pins. And in that Vivace movement, I had a little trouble with my end pin. It was, uh, it became the incredibly shrinking end pin. So I ended up playing like a Baroque cellist by holding the cello <laughs> between my legs. <laughs> Woo, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, at any rate, I'm sure in the Vivace you heard that, that late return to the tonic. It's so interesting the way Telemann um, does that in the variety of places where he puts that return. Um, a jig is the dance that you would imagine, a jig. Uh, the skipping dance, run, ta -dun, ta -dun, ta -dun, ta -dun, ta -dun. just like you you would skip, and they really uh, most often are are too slow to to really uh, t um, skip to or or skip in place to, um, but but these these movements are always in an eighth note pulse. So it's three eight. The jig that you heard was nine eight. It was three beats per measure, but each of the three beats in the measure was worth three eighth notes. So it it was for me a nine eight jig is pretty rare. The three uh, Bach jigs I'm going to play for you come in two of the other possible eighth note triple meters. The first one is the D minor suite and it's in 3-8, uh, which means there's just three eighth notes per measure. Now next week when I play Fantasy 12, the middle movement is a ginormous 6-8 jig and it's, it, it, it's just rocking. I mean, it, one of my favorite movements. Um, and, but that's next week. But the reason why I bring it up is that you won't hear a 6-8 jig today, but you will hear one next week. So you just heard 9-8. And this D minor jig, one of my favorites, is um, in 3-8. And again, the last movement of the second box suite. So next, 
I have for you um, what I like to call the head banging jig. It, it's, uh, it's in 12-8 and every single measure has 12 eighth notes in it except the cadences at the end of each section. Um, again, it's a, it's a binary form. Now, these long form binary things, every alaman that I've played for you by Bach, all the courants that I've played by Telemann and Bach, most of the, the all, all the sarabans that I've played for you, uh, or most of the sarabans by Telemann and all of the sarabans by Bach, most often, the A section and the B section are quite equal, the same number of measures. In this case, box A section is one half the length of the B section. And even though this rarely happens in the box suites, the A section comes back. There's actually a proper recapitulation in the proper place for sonata form. Um, and so, I, you know, you should listen for that. Uh, again, th there's, it's, it, there are 12 eighth notes per bar, and there are uh, every, every, every eighth note sounds in every bar, except for three measures along the way. Um, there are 42 measures, so you can figure out how many eighth notes this is. I'm not going to take any repeats, because, you know, it's a lot of head banging. And At any rate, when I get to the uh, recapitulation, um, to watch out for the head banging. <laughs> Finally, uh, tonight, I'd like to thank my Valentine, <laughs> who is uh, um, <laughs> behind the screen, running the mixing board, the black magic converter. <laughs> She's actually the, the, the author of the set in terms of uh, um, keeping the plants happy and healthy and putting them in the right place and the lighting. Um, uh, at any rate, to all of you out there, happy Valentine's Day. Um, and uh, I feel very lucky to have uh, my particular techie this evening, my Valentine's techie. Um, this last jig is from that fifth suite of Bach, that French style suite. It's a little different. Um, it's, it's slower. It's, um, well, the whole suite's in C minor, so it's a little more uh, introspective for certain. Um, and it's not at all uh, bombastic. But what's interesting about it and what also relates to the Telemann fantasy that we played is that the Siciliana 
was one of those galanterie. It, it, was, it was a fashionable, yet frivolous, unconventional dance form that Telemann stuck in as a first movement. Um, in box, in all six box suites, there's never a Sicilian. In his three sonatas and three partitas, there's really only one, and that's, I think it's the first sonata of Bach, which begins with a, a grave, which is really an allemande, and then goes to this crazy fugue. And then, in the place of the Sarabande, has a, a Sicilian, and then a G. Uh, the, the first sonata. And so in all of those 12 works that we talked about last week by J.S. Bach, it's this, the only Sicilian. What I think is interesting is that in the Bach suites, there isn't one, but this movement uses the Sicilian rhythm. And I think it's, uh, it's um, I'm going to take both repeats and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it a little straighter the first time, and a little double dotted or thrown, the and on the re, on the repeats, um, but this is a such an elegant way to end the fifth suite after uh, th this prelude and fugue, and then you heard the courants last week, pretty pretty heavy. Um, the, excuse me, the gavats last week. Um, but at any rate, the Gig from the fifth suite of Bach. Thank you all for joining us for episode five. Next week, the 12th Telemann Fantasy and two 
duets for cello written at about the same time by composers who were very contemporary to Telemann and Bach. One, a uh, Frenchman, Bois Mortier, and another German, Jacob Klein. Adrian will be joining me, and uh, so you'll get to hear Adrian play Lee, and I'll play Barbara. And we'll see you next week at 7 p.m. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs>